Greetings all. Welcome to another session here of uh, Tuesday Talks. Today we're going to be moving into uh, early modern English and our discussion here on the history of English. And we'll be looking at some of the changes that were going on and some of the ideas that people had regarding how to create, quote unquote, the perfect English and the people in different classes who were using language in different ways. Uh, again, most of this we should be able to understand um, in the writing anyway, some of the words are going to be different, and certainly the pronunciations would be different. Let's take a look at the Babel of Renaissance English. There were a number of linguists who were trying to fix this problem of the Babel of English. And what they meant by that was that there were all these different kinds of English going on in England and other parts of the, of the globe um, as English uh, expanded, and they didn't like it. They didn't like the fact that on the island there were actually certain groups of English speakers who couldn't communicate with others. So it was a problem that they wanted to remedy. They wanted to try to make everybody speak the same language. Okay. Now, my question that I had as I was reading this was, doesn't that sound like today? Aren't there people who were saying, well, that's not really English or that's not good English? Or I actually have met students from Nigeria whose first language, whose official language is English. And they would come to the United States to study and they would be put in an ESL classroom because their English was not the same as our English. Um, so there are people who want to do that today. They want to universalize the English language. Uh, not going to happen. Um, <laughs> don't know that it could, theoretically. Um, I don't even know if it would be possible to do that because, as uh, we've mentioned, language is a universal thing. It's a living thing through the lives of the people. Now, it can be, people can try to impose it on you. Uh, and they'll get some success out of that, but they won't get much success out of it. Trying to force a people to use a language only has limited success. Um, so we do have those ideas today. Anyway, Renaissance Englishes were the plethora of different ideas, you know, the different languages that were spoken. However, there was one group who thought their English was the best, and they were the rich, the elite, the aristocracy. And uh, so they considered their language to be, you know, a better, upper class. Uh, it wasn't called the King's English just yet. It would be uh, in, a, in a few years, a couple decades. Uh, but during early modern English, um, it, the, the idea here of the King's English had not yet set in. There will come a time when Southern English will be that way, but it has not happened yet here. All right, so this idea of a proper or better or universal English, the idea spanned even back into Middle English and then throughout early modern English um, because of this distinction in class and the little differences in the usage of language, people would get frustrated. People would begin to judge you based on how you spoke. Again, doesn't it sound familiar? For those of you who have taken a course in phonology or <clears throat> uh, syntax, You'll definitely have had the opportunity to listen to how people pronounce words, and we judge them based on how they pronounce them. <clears throat> Caxton, uh, in his research, he divided the country of England uh, into four separate unintelligible areas. <laughs> uh, the north, the south, the east, and west, and or basically the main three would be the north, south, and west. Um but these were areas where people had difficulty understanding people from a different area. So early modern English is not necessarily the birth of Renaissance English. But at this time, you begin to see this awareness of the richness and the diversity of English. And I use those words, richness and diversity, because I actually don't see it as a negative, like many of the linguists did uh, during this time. What they wanted to do was to have uh, everything unified because they didn't like the other types of English. Um, but um, I, I see it as a richness. I see it as a, as a diversity. Okay, the regions that were going on here, um, it was during this time where people, where linguists were going out and trying to examine what was going on with regard to dialects, and they were collecting uh, information, and they began to use this word dialect as opposed to a separate language. Most uh, linguists, again, did not like dialects. Uh, Caro, however, he did like them. He thought it was interesting how language was being used and modified and, and how it grew uh, and, and molded kind of like a fire. Um, so he appreciated it. Um, 
he was identifying the Renaissance of English, and he figured that it aided uh, how the the marriage between uh, culture and language. So bear in mind that before this time, there was no real cognizant, uh, cognitive uh, understanding that culture, you know, culture and uh, and language go together. They didn't see that there was this connection. Carew and then others in future began to recognize that there were. They saw this connection. Um, they also began to talk about people who were cultured and people who weren't cultured. And cultured, of course, meant somebody who was upper class, somebody who was elite, somebody who spoke properly um, instead of spoke proper. <laughs> um, uh, also were the ideas of someone saying, you know, well, this is an upper class activity. Opera is high class, for example. Uh, and there were other things that were low class. You didn't want to mix the two because upper class was upper class. As I mentioned in an earlier video, the whole phrase here of common or vulgar, which also meant common, was just a simple way of trying to describe the difference between those who spoke this particular English and those who spoke this particular English. And they got to see that dichotomy. Um, so the three primary regions, again, were North, South, and Western. Um, and if you, if you were from the, the South or Standard English and you went West, you was a different language, different, not a different language, a different dialect. And sometimes it was difficult to understand. Of course, the Southern dialect becomes the more prominent one as we go forward. But still, you have these three regions. You have this idea now of, oh, I'm cultured and you're not. Uh, you're a barbarian, I guess, actually, someone mentions the Western dialect actually is considered more barbarous. It's a lower form of, uh, of English. Again, that's according to the Southerners, the elites, who will say uh, it's less proper English. These people were the least educated. Now, that's a key thing that you could sh can find here. You can identify or try to identify the way, uh, you can identify or try to identify how educated someone is by the way they speak by the way they pronounce their words. And so that's a, a key. So when you go out and listen to people, listen to how they're speaking, and then find out what their educational background is. And you're gonna be able to see some distinction. Those who are quote unquote more educated uh, via the academy, via schools, are gonna be pronouncing things differently. The Westerners here, they were quote unquote less educated and, and there are examples that some thought were fun, that were interesting. Uh, for example, John Redford's play, Wit and Science, He's in, he includes the Western dialect within the play and this the character in the play isn't too bright. Okay, So they deliberately used that accent with that particular uh, character. There are also many malapropisms. Okay? This is when someone uses a word and they use it improperly. Uh, I love this style of humor when people um, accidentally use a word that they're not uh, supposed to be using, but they use it. And, uh, and of course, if you don't understand what the joke is going on here, you miss out on it. Um, I want to show you a little clip here from uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Uh, within the play, you see uh, a character here who is... <laughs> Again, not too bright, and listen to the words that he uses when he's speaking. What would you with me on his neighbors? Marry, sir, I'll watch tonight, except in your worship's presence, have taken a couple of as arrant knaves as any in Messina. Ah, the good old man, sir. You will be talking, as they say. When the age is in, the wit is out. <laughs> <laughs> well said, you faith, neighbor Virgis. <laughs> oh. Well, God's a good man, and two men ride a horse, one must ride behind. Ah, old men are not alike, alas, good neighbor. Indeed, neighbor, he comes too short of you. Well, uh, gifts that God gives. <coughs> Neighbors, you are tedious. Well, it pleases your worship to say so. But we are the poor Duke's officers. But truly, for mine own part, if I were as tedious as a king, I could find in my heart to bestow it all on your worship. All thy tediousness on me? 
I would fain know what you have to say. Our Lord, sir, have indeed comprehended two auspicious persons, and we would this morning have them examined before your worship. Take that examination yourself and bring it me. I am now in great haste, as it may appear unto you. Drink some wine. There you go. We are now to examinations, then. Meet me at the jail. So as you were listening to these, uh, these guards speak, they had comprehended some auspicious men. <laughs> That's malapropism. They're not using the right word. <laughs> um, and Shakespeare here is using this as humor, again, with the quote-unquote not smart people. Okay. So you have a lot of these things going on because people want to appear to be upper class. Okay. But they're not. And by the way, I would highly recommend that movie. It is hysterical. Um, the, it's entitled, again, Much Ado About Nothing. Um, very funny, very funny play by Shakespeare and uh, very well acted. Um, hopefully you, you'll enjoy it. Anyway, a lot of malapropisms. Uh, in the uh, northern area, there is, the, the, there is a distinct accent and a distinct vocabulary. And a lot of the vocabulary they're using, interestingly enough, comes from Old English and from Norse. Uh, so they're holding on to the older words type of thing. Includes many literary works as well. And words that are, quote-unquote, Old English fossils. Um, and then in the South, we have the King's English, the proper English, the standard English. The English that we would know today would be, uh, you know, when you're talking to someone who is educated, that type of English. We've got three general regions um, that's going on here. And a lot of times, they're not distinguishable. If you'll remember, during Middle English, there, became, there came a distinction between those in the North and the South, and they could barely understand one another. Same thing is happening here. Uh, another rapid increase during this time of the the babble of the Renaissance, and we have a tremendous increase in vocabulary. There are a lot of new foreign words that are coming in, and there are also new uh, new words being created or neologisms. Uh, they derive from Latin, from Greek, uh, from Greek endings, and people are combining them to make new words. Most interestingly is this whole inkhorn polemic. And uh, the Inkhorn polemic is talking about people who create new words to appear to be, uh, to sound uh, uh, educated, upper class. And so they create new words. We can do that today. In fact, Shakespeare created many new words. Things like friendship, uh, neighborhood were words that he actually created at that time. It would be a new word. But a lot of people who were middle class wanting to appear to be upper class uh, people who were, uh, or from people from the West or from the North, they wanted to appear more uh, proper. They would add, they would be creating these new words. So there's a lot of new words that were considered, uh, that were being developed. Some of them uh, were not uh, well received, especially the elites who stood, understood the language better, at least understood their language better. And since theirs was the standard, everybody had to follow along. Um, so we have uh, these people looking at these new words, and they're like, this isn't real. This is fake. It's boring. It's uh, dry. It's not, uh, it's not a nice English. Okay? Some consider the new words to be faux English, okay? and that's a play on words because faux is not standard English, but it is now. We use this word faux, uh, fake, not real. Uh, so some examples of these new words are words like conspicuous, contradictory, demonstrate, frivolous, insinuate, right, mediate, obstruction, all words that we would use today. But at the time that they were introduced during early modern English times, they were considered, you know, new words that, uh, uh, you know, were not actually standard English at the time. Uh, the elites did not like them nearly as much. We can do that today as well. All right. The elites now are concerned that these commoners, these simple folk <clears throat> could learn their language and rise in social stature. And it was done. Especially someone who was good at learning uh, the other language, the southern dialect, they could try to sneak in up and, appear, and not appear uh, to be different. Uh, and the elites were a little concerned that that was going to happen. So uh, the the proper way of pronouncing, the proper use of language kind of became a gateway. Uh, to find out, uh, you know, to keep someone in or to keep someone out. Um, 
end and uh, the elites when they were preferring that this was a way to make sure that you kept those other people out because they didn't know the proper way to speak okay so kind of became a gateway or a shibboleth if you remember from another class uh, i'm sorry another lecture there's another group of people okay you've got the upper class you have the middle class who's trying to reach up there to the upper class and then you've got the underclass the group that's below and they start creating their own language okay and they basically start creating their own pronunciation and their own their own uh, vocabulary, and it exists today. Canting is the language of thieves and beggars, apparently developed in conjunction with the underworld. They were the scum and villainy of England. Um, and so they created their own language. And again, it was not well understood and well known by by people of the other groups of the other classes and it, it becomes it becomes a complete language um this language was not only not well received but they considered it to be a a coercive um a component to society and they wanted to get rid of it they wanted to make sure that it wasn't being used uh, there were even some places uh, where uh, it was legislated to be illegal. You weren't allowed to teach this form of English, or you weren't allowed to use this form of ling English. Um, so it's uh, actually a language, and it was a language that probably parts of it are still uh, around today. Special vocabulary, special ways of pronouncing things, different meanings for similar words. It still exists, uh, at least in part today. Um, and for most of us, if we were to go listen to it, we wouldn't understand it, okay? But they did, but they're in their group, and uh, the idea of trying to suppress that still exists today as well. You'll notice later on in time, as we move into the full-fledged early modern English and, and closer into modern English, you'll find even more laws on the books trying to prevent people from uh, speaking certain forms, certain dialects of English. Rather interesting that the government tries to force it on on the people. In the north, we have some very interesting things, and that was the Old English, and it was considered by some to be a better language. Um, okay, it was the better language. Let's hold on to the Old English form. Let's hold on to the the you know the the Old English vocabulary, the grammar that was there, and people wanted to hang on to it more so in the north than anywhere else. Also, there were a lot of poets who thought it was nice to hold on to these old ideas. Now, when you read poetry. There are times where you hear more uh, flowery speech, uh, older terms for words, older spellings for words. Okay, and that's for um, poetic license. Okay, I got that. But there are also people who thought that Old English was on the way out. Now, obviously today we don't even read it. We can't even understand when we go to look at it. But during this time, there were still people who were trying to hold on to that old way of reading and seeing. Today, I guess we could say that Old English is dead perhaps, hmm? uh, at least in the normal active use of it, right? Um, but anyway, some people said it was on the way out, and other people also discouraged the use of these new words, okay? And these old words, these uh, archisms, right? These, uh, these old, old English words, and again, except in poetry. In uh, poetry, there were people who were trying to do that, okay? And then the metaplasm is where you're trying to change the sound of a syllable or whatnot in order to make it sound nice within the poetry. And they still do that today, but they were doing that with Old English words as well. Um, so you, you have, within this Babel time, you've got, a, uh, you've got different classes all over the place. You've got different regions with different dialects, and you've got different jobs where people are using language differently. You've got all these things that are going on during this Renaissance Babel, and the people who are in charge, the elites, don't like it, and they want to try to find some way to uh, un unify everything. Uh, it was during this time that dictionaries became a more standard. The English dictionaries emerged in the 1700 in the 17th uh, century and were considered dialectal dictionaries. They were actually dictionaries from dialects, so that people could understand what is this unique word that I don't have in my dialect. Okay. Um, it wasn't a standard dictionary yet, but it was getting definitely closer to it, defining particular words. Uh, Caudry had a table uh, alphabetical and. Uh, Cockerham had the English Dictionary, and during the Renaissance times, there were many technical dictionaries uh, for particular areas or job skills that people were beginning to write and print. 
And so we have the emergence here of these dictionaries coming up. Why? So that we can help understand one another better. Now the conclusion of this uh, time period, we have the Royal Society who decides to create a project to develop a universal language. Big change that's going to happen because of this project. Okay. Uh, interesting question that I had is what if they would have succeeded? Uh, everyone would, ha would have had the same language then, right? Uh, everyone would have been universally speaking the same language. Would that have been a plus? Maybe. Would it have been minuses? Most definitely. There are going to th be things that you lose because you have du you've lost diversity. Uh, there is good to be had with unity, but there's also things to lose because you get rid of diversity. The diversity of language is what introduces so many new interesting words. Because you have these new and interesting words, it makes for the spice in language. And that would be my conclusion as well. And that is all for the Babel of uh, Renaissance. I do hope that you've enjoyed this little uh, talk about uh, how language was uh, flowering and growing and how there were some that wanted to rein things in. And I do hope that if you have a chance, go watch that video. Thank you very much for stopping by, and I hope to see you later.